Hello everybody, Mr. McKeever here today. We're going to talk about two, what seemingly is kind of two disparate issues kind of combined together. Both related to what's going on in the late 18, early 1900s, uh, and all of it kind of setting us up towards this push towards the modern age. So the issues are going to be labor and women's rights. So here we go. So first up, we're talking about trade unions during this time period. Uh, the labor movement is really built around the, the improvement of lives of the average workers. And as we talked about in our unit in the Industrial Revolution, uh, trade unions and labor unions are what is going to drive change to improve the lives of the average person. Whether it's through strikes or what we call collective bargaining, where you're working uh, with other members of your same profession in order to get better wages, conditions, uh, maybe health insurance, uh, these things are going to be, you know, really advocated for by these labor and trade unions. And because of that, we see people's lives improve dramatically. So trade unions are going to play a really important role in the late 18 and early 1900s. And not only just because they're improving the lives of average workers, but because they are dramatically changing the political scenes in the countries in which they are. So do they overall make change? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, there, there is one exception to that. Russia, on the other hand, just kind of ignores the existence of labor unions. They don't really adopt the practice at all, and, you know, that's probably not coincidental as to why the Russians eventually are the first communist country on the planet. Uh, instead of making instrument, incremental changes through labor unions and trade unions, uh, the situation just progressively goes so bad that instead they go the Marxist route of a revolution of the masses. So, along with the creation of labor unions and trade unions, we are also seeing the birth of political parties in Europe as well, too. In the United States, we've seen political parties since the birth of the country. Uh, while George Washington wasn't affiliated with a single political party, after George Washington, every single U.S. president is some way representative of a political party in the country. Europe is now moving towards that as well, except they decide to do a little bit different. And instead of having a two-party system, which is what develops here in the United States, they'll have a multi-party system. And in this multi-party system, we'll see labor parties created, focusing on the lives of the working and middle class. We'll see socialist parties begin to get representation, and more conservative parties and liberal parties, based on the different ideas of liberalism and conservatism that we've talked about. So the situation in Europe is changing. Socialism is now becoming more and more prevalent across the European continent. In fact, for the first time ever, socialists, along with trade unionists, and even Polish nationalists and anarchists, are all going to get together in one location. In 1964, we call this the First International. This is 16 years after Marx wrote his Communist Manifesto. And in fact, he's going to be a keynote speaker at this First International meeting. And even though the vast majority of people in this meeting aren't actually people who believe in Marxist ideology, it, it creates a lot of uh, confirmation and at least credence to his, his beliefs. The First International really served as kind of a coming out party for the, the socialist movements in Europe. They had been around for a while. Uh, they hadn't garnered a lot of support, but once they all met together at the First International, they see a level of legitimacy established, that there are a lot more people who kind of believe similar or like ideologies across the continent. That being said, uh, we will see that Marxism is going to be kind of become the most prominent form of socialism out there. It doesn't mean it's the only. In fact, it probably receives the least amount of actual change that it enacts, but it's still the one that becomes iconically associated with socialism, and it's the one that most socialists would have identified with during this period of time. So all of this stuff is, is really coming together into one larger movement, but it doesn't mean that there's division. there isn't division amongst the different peoples involved here. While socialism is, is oftentimes to be characterized as Marxism, and Marxism was one of the more prominent forms of it, there are different other socialist groups who would have had nothing to do with Marx, that wanted nothing to do with his idea of revolution of the masses. The Fabian movement in Great Britain is going to be around making small incremental change within the systems of government that exists. They don't believe in the idea of this full-out revolution of the masses. Uh, and that this violent revolution, in fact, would destroy what has been a progress towards better life that most people are seeing. 
So instead, they will work within the systems of parliament, they will work as a minority party in order to finally start to make some change in England, including the National Insurance Act of 1911, which establishes some basic ideas of insurance for all workers in industrial fields. So they would pay a part of their insurance and the government would pay another part. And then that way they would have insurance if something were to happen on the job, like a little Temmy losing a finger or something else. And in France, we see something similar, but a little bit less successful at first. Instead of having the Fabian movement, you have opportunism, which is a bunch of smaller different socialist pocket pockets across the country looking to try to enact change on a local level, but they never really gain the support that they need to to really make any substantive change. So instead, they will all rally together in what we call the syndicalist form of French socialism. Sorry, it's a little bit hard to say. Uh, where they will start to use more direct methods, such as striking and collective bargaining in order to improve the lives of workers. But again, both of these groups would have never agreed with Marx's ideology about creating a violent revolution. Instead, they are looking for more of that smaller incremental change. In other countries, we also see socialist movements pop up. Uh, in Germany, which is where this picture is from, we see the growth of the German Social Democratic Party. This is a group of socialists who immediately garner the animosity of Otto von Bismarck, who takes him as a, a kind of threat to the, the country that he has created. So he's going to do his best to disband the group, uh, trying to outlaw socialist ideologies, but instead the Social Democratic Party of Germany is able to enact some pretty substantial changes. Uh, the Health Insurance Bill of 1883 will establish that the German workers and important industries are going to receive, again, some form of health insurance if they are injured on the job. They will pay two-thirds of the cost, whereas the government or the industry will pay the extra third. So now everyone is starting to be insured in that regards, and we're improving the working conditions for the average person. The Erfurt Program of 1891 is also looking to make that change in the daily lives, but it's not doing so in the way of the Marxist revolution, but more again, this substantive change. Uh, so while people are like, they, they, they adhere, they think that Marx's ideas are maybe the right option long term, that, that doesn't mean that they're abandoning the idea of making change now while the system is still there. So both the Health Insurance Act of 1883 in Germany and the 1911 in England uh, are enacting change to benefit the average working person. So we are seeing these movements grow across the European continent. In Russia, though, we see something very different. Russia's situation is getting progressively worse. Uh, as we've talked about in the past, we've had some struggles with leadership at this point in time. Uh, Tsar Alexander III was very repressive in his controlling of liberalism and nationalism in Russia. And he's also going to go through a pretty forceful industrialization policy that's going to attempt to modernize Russia in a very short amount of time. But this is, as we know, going to be a rough period. Industrialization is rough for anyone involved, especially if you're trying to cram it into a very short period of time. You're just going to make the experience worse. And eventually, when Tsar Alexander is gone and his son, Zinkless II, becomes the Tsar, we're just going to see the situation in Russia progressively get a little bit worse. They're able to start introducing new industries. They're going to employ a man named Sergei Vietti to industrialize Russia, and he will, but in doing so, he's going to alienate the working class in Russia. And this is going to lead us to the rise of a guy named Lenin. This is a video here that if you look at the PowerPoint that's online, uh, you'll be able to see the entirety of the video for this. And it walks through the early days of Lenin's life. Uh, Lenin is kind of in a, an interesting scenario. He's a very educated individual during this time period. He is also uh, part of a family that you know wasn't afraid of being confrontational to the issues that are out there. His son, his brother, my apologies, is going to be someone who ends up being executed as part of the attempt to kill the Tsar, and these are going to be formative things in his life that is going to lead to him becoming the man who revolutionized Russia. Lenin himself uh, is greatly immersed in the whole idea of Marxist socialism. 
Uh, in fact, he will join a secret revolutionary party that is designed specifically around ending the czars in Russia and establishing a socialist society in the nation. It was called the Bolshevik Party. This Bolshevik Party is going to be very outspoken in their hatred of the Tsar, and it will get all of them exiled, including Lenin himself, who actually ends up spending time in Germany. But his story is by no means over, because while he's in Germany, he's learning more and more about socialism, and he will make a return to Russia uh, when it suits the Germans to do so. So all of this is really what's getting us to this point of confrontation in Russia. While as we saw socialism in other parts of Europe making change, it was never progressing towards something, you know, bombastic, something that was going to create a revolution. But Lenin is going to be that catalyst in Russia. Because when 1905 comes around, Russia's gone through about 15 years of industrialization, and it's really quite terrible. And this is going to lead to confrontation amongst the social classes in Russia. So this, this confrontation comes in the form of a uh, political protest that kind of goes awry. Workers are upset about the conditions that they have in the, these new industrial factories, so they go to the Russian Winter Palace in order to speak in protest, the Tsar Nicholas at the time, and it ends up er, resulting in, as you see from the image here, a little bit of blood. Uh, thousands of workers led to mass panic. And again, there's a video attached to this, which you are welcome to watch. Uh, it kind of portrays as to what is happening. Um, it's not a pleasant scenario. So all of this is pushing us more and more towards revolution. So 200,000 marches on uh, the Rinter Palace in 1905. He isn't there. Hundreds are killed. And now strikes are breaking out across Russia. And Tsar Nicholas, who was never really known for being that proactive in dealing with anything, or even being that effective of a ruler, uh, is, is forced to try to give something to these people who are frustrated about the situation in, in Russia. And Russia will create a legislature. So he creates this legislature. Uh, and reality is it doesn't really do anything. Because two years later, after things had subsided for a little bit, Tsar Nicholas decides just to get rid of it. And this is all just progressing us towards a revolution that is, is coming very clearly uh, in Russia's future. So that's part one of this lesson. Let's go to part two. So we're pivoting pretty hard here from talking about labor and socialism and all that stuff at the turn of the 20th century to now looking at the situation for women during this time period as well, too. This was something we kind of glossed over, so I don't believe this is actually in your study guides for the unit, so I'll keep this pretty quick, but I want to make sure that you're at least on the same page as to what is happening during this time. If you remember, we've described for you what the life of a woman like is in the 1870s. Uh, they can have children, be mom, work crappy jobs, or be a prostitute. What they can't do is, you know, anything else. So their situation is very limited. And life for them is, is progressively worse. So we're going to see a push towards women starting to be able to make change and improvement in their own life. And the first thing on the agenda list uh, for the women at this time period is, one, they want to be able to own things. So hypothetically, if they did end up getting divorced from their husband, they would be able to keep property that is theirs, maybe something that is a family heirloom or anything else. If they didn't have these rights, if their husband were to die or for whatever reason they got divorced, uh, the mother would be dependent exclusively on their sons to take care of them. And that's not exactly the most reassuring way to live. So women will advocate, at least in England, uh, for some basic property rights. And in 1882, the Married Women's Property Act will, will come and actually establish women some basic levels of ownership of things so that they aren't completely dependent upon their children upon the death of their husband. So this is progress. Well, we also see women looking in general at their whole experience of life. They already know that they can't own things and we're trying to make some changes there, but they couldn't enact a divorce themselves. Their husband could divorce them though. And when they did, they could take the children away from them and women had very little if no rights. Uh, there's really no protection for women when it comes to sexual offenses. Like it's, this is just a rough period of time. So we, we see women trying to make change and they're gonna do it eventually through exposure to new jobs. But this is going to be a long process. Uh, women aren't going to be able to immediately improve their lives at the end of the 1800s, which is really depressing. 
But it's going to be education that's going to be the vehicle for their eventual embetterment of their lives. Men, for the most part, were able to get education throughout their childhood now. European countries had started adopting schools for men that were pretty widespread at this point. For women, though, that's not exactly the case. They could get a primary education, so to be basically able to read and write and maybe do some basic arithmetic, but they couldn't go to secondary schools, so that's kind of your high school type exposure. And in most countries, women aren't even allowed in a university, let alone receive a degree from one. So Switzerland in 1860 allowed women to attend universities. Britain, they allowed them in 1878, but it wasn't until the 1920s that they could receive degrees in their fields. Uh, in Russia, it isn't until the start of World War I in 1914 that women could even go to college. So the situation is rough. And it isn't until we start to see more and more women getting involved in teaching that we start to see improvement in that route. Uh, one area that people oftentimes accepted women in was as primary school teachers. Because, you know, we already encouraged them to be mothers. Why not encourage them to take that role uh, and do it in the classroom as well, too? And if you're going to encourage women to be teachers, even as children of a young age, you do actually need to provide them a basic level of education. So women who got involved in teaching started being able to get that additional education beyond what they would have gotten from grades, you know, kindergarten through fifth grade. So this was making progress in the right direction for women. And once some women started becoming educated, they started opening doors in other fields. Women started taking up roles in retail, selling things. They started being able to work as office assistants because they could read and write and take dictation, which if someone was reading something to them, they could write down what was said. Uh, they could be secretaries. They could get government jobs doing paperwork. These were all opportunities for women to get outside of the household and earn a living. And this is really going to be huge for women having an opportunity to improve their standing in society. And eventually, we start to see women taking a more active political role. And it's going to be women of the middle class that are doing this. Working class women are not, for the most part, going to be involved in politics. Uh, because it's the middle class women who are sitting at home. Their husband no longer needs them to work anymore because the dad is the breadwinner. So mom is sitting there and is, you know, disengaged with life around her. She is part of what we will call this cult of domesticity. Where they sit at home and do nothing. So women, out of frustration of this life, or just out of sheer boredom, start becoming involved in various different organizations. Many of them are religious ones early on, uh, but eventually this is starting to open them up to exposure to different types of causes and thoughts, and it's encouraging women to start to enact change, or at least push for change in their lives. So we see the birth of the modern feminist movement. Women during this time period faced a lot of struggles when it came to promoting women's rights. Uh, this concept of a, a feminist movement where really all they're trying to advocate for at this point in time is basic rights that men had received, such as the ability to vote, uh, property laws in many countries, the ability to divorce, things like that. And the backlash they're getting is, while it's from many men, of course, uh, but it's also from a lot of women who thought that it's outside of a woman's role to do, th do these things. And people will kind of view this idea of equal rights kind of in the same way if people were viewing socialism during this time period. So frustration with socialism is going to lead to frustration to feminism. Because they'll equate the idea of equal genders as these ideas of what Marxism and other societies are introducing. So there's a lot of pushback here. But it doesn't stop the women who are, ad are advocates of this. People like Millicent Fawcett is going to lead a creation of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, where they gather thousands of women together, protest, and march for the ability of women to be able to vote. People like Emmeline Pankhurst are going to lobby the British government so much that eventually, after World War I, women will start to get the right to vote across the Western world. But it took decades of work to get there you know and right now we're looking at a time period where it's now been a hundred years 
100 years since women have gotten the vote in the United States and only slightly more than that in Britain and other countries in Europe. Uh, but it's still a challenge that they had to fight through and has helped create the world that we have here today. Um, so, women are advocating. Life is changing. Labor unions are pushing new concepts, improving the lives of workers. And at the turn of the 20th century, things are dra uh, changing pretty dramatically. All right. Thanks. Have a good night.